Hello there, my fellow space privateers, and welcome back to some Battletech lore. In today's episode, we're gonna cover a brand new topic, but one which could also be associated with our more recent military overview series. And to be entirely honest, I'm actually surprised it took me this long to arrive at this coverage, as this lore is both entertaining and quite obvious. Ladies and gentlemen, let us take a look at the pirates of the Battletech setting. And not just any pirates, but arguably the best pirates, the pirates of the periphery. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Stories of periphery pirates have been a staple of Hall of It broadcasts for decades. But the vast majority of these stories are fictional. Fanciful tales, long on fantasy, but short on reality. The following section provides a rare, first-hand account of Paula Lady Death Treveline herself, former ruler of the periphery bandit kingdom known as the Tortuga Dominions. In exchange for his strategic intelligence on certain star systems, Treveline agreed to compile an overview of pirate groups operating in the periphery as well. Therefore, to quote, Throughout mankind's history, storytellers have romanticized pirates, portraying them as the freest of all souls, forced to take on the open sea, or in this case, the solar currents, by the tyranny of oppressive governments, or by deprivation and hopelessness. Forced to survive by the same cunning savagery that rules lower beasts, the pirate lives life on the forward edge of the frontier. But real pirates are far less noble and lead far less romantic lives than those of the popular imagination. Many are simply unable or unwilling to adjust to life among civilized, law-abiding people. They care little about high-sounding ideals like freedom or justice. They take up lives for the simple, unsophisticated and ignoble pleasure of battle and pillaging, or to satisfy their own greed and lust for power. Ironically, these are the same impulses that motivate the founders of the so-called civilized states as well. Any honest student of human history will tell you that piracy has existed alongside civilization since mankind first took to the Terran seas. Before then even, if you count the highwaymen and the brigands roaming the lawless countrysides. For as long as frontiers free of this control of strict authority have existed, Pirates, bandits, and rooks have plied their trade. When humanity made a leap to the stars, an entire new lawless frontier was created, and ambitious individuals quickly exploited the opportunities it presented. Indeed, many revisionist historians conveniently forget the fact that Rudolf Ryan, a recognized pioneer of space colonization, was also a smuggler and an anti-alliance subversive and Ryan wasn't the only pirate whose reputation would be sanitized in later years. Dig deep enough in any great house's backyard and you will unearth skeletons and not the most pristine bleach bones of laboratory displays. You'll find yellowed bones, some with pieces of rotting flesh still attached, often displaying the cracks and splinters of old trauma. Ever wonder why the memoirs of Reynard Davion are available only in edited or abridged versions? The founder of the Capellan Confederation, Elias Jung Liao, was a known terrorist responsible for many atrocities. And that is not buried information. The Capellans are almost proud of that. When the old Terran hegemony sent an ambassador to Liao, the despot returned to Terra only with the ambassador's head, well pickled of course. No one can say that Elias didn't know how to send a message. I wish I'd known him. You might even call the confederation the very first of the bandit kingdoms. Although its sheer power would force the civilized nations to recognize their legitimacy long ago. Similar figures can be found in the histories of the periphery nations. For example, the Rimworld's Republic was founded by a murderous renegade on the run. The Magistracy of Canopus was founded by the Centrella family, the descendants of a Free Worlds League deserter and freebooter. The Tortuga Dominions, my old stomping grounds, were settled as a pirate domain from the start, its leaders offering no excuses or pretenses. The Dominions were founded by the remnants of the Federated Sun's own 237th Light Cavalry Regiment. 
As long as the nations of the periphery and the inner sphere make war on one another, they will produce a steady supply of pirates. Because wars always create large numbers of military trained personnel. Inevitably, some of those personnel become disaffected with the system and want to use their training for their own gain. Similarly, wars inevitably create power vacuums and ripe opportunity for seizing weapons and supplies. The succession wars and the war against the clans provide examples of both these truths. For example, the Federated Sun's callous treatment of Fushida's fusiliers during the clan invasion drove those mercenaries to the Dominions, where they set themselves in my old position. And now House Davion has to contend with both of us. We pirates are legion, born again into each generation, rising from the conflicts that humanity loves to visit on itself. Most pirate bands do not maintain large mech forces. The cost of maintaining such complex machines are quite high, and most pirate bands need little more than a company's worth of battle mechs anyway. Typically, pirates use battle mechs to intimidate their targets, to cow the local population or to run off the local militia's armored vehicles. Pirates strike fast and hard, take what they want, and then fade away before organized, large-scale forces engage them in battle. Hence, most bands do not worry about meeting large enemy forces. Typically, only banded kingdoms deploy mech forces of battalion size or bigger. Why? Because pirate bands turn into kingdoms when they grow too large to stealthily move among the backworlds and are forced to stake claims over territory. And because a banded kingdom cannot afford to lose its operating base, it has to stand and defend it from attacks, hence the employment of a larger mech force. The ability to intercept, board and plunder commercial cargo vessels is just as crucial to pirates now as it was to the brigands of the 16th century. Consequently, aerospace assets are more important to pirate forces even than battle mechs. Elite pilots are highly valued among pirates, as just a few of them can cripple a dropship escort and render a commercial jumpship ready for boarding. Pirate pilots tend to experience high attrition rates, however and many of them are green rather than elite. Of course, successful piracy also requires dropships, jumpships and crews to operate them. After all, a pirate force has to be able to transport its men and return with the booty. Multiple dropships are a necessity, at least one for armed forces and one for cargo. A pirate band that tried to get away with one dropship, unless it was something like an old fortress class, would be starving in less than a year, if the members didn't mutiny first. Pirate dropship crews have to be well trained in high-speed approaches and the efficient transfer of cargo. Crewmen have to be proficient in zero-g combat as well, the better to repel borders and make assaults upon enemy vessels. The skill and daring of pirate jumpship navigators is legendary. The need for stealth often require pirate jumpships to enter systems at pirate points. Consequently, pirate leaders value their navigators above all assets. Pirates do tend to prefer battle mechs over armor and infantry, because armor and infantry provide less bang for the buck. They lack the intimidation factor and raw firepower of a battle mech. Rather than filling their cargo hold with armored vehicles and infantry troops, many pirates prefer to stick to mechs and reserve cargo space for the spoils of battle. Typically, they only employ armored vehicles and infantry for the defense of their base or banded kingdom. Pirate Economics 101 says, the more mouths you have to feed, the less is left for you. This simple reality has led to three basic rules in choosing crew size and composition. Take only as many as you need. Find pirates with multiple specialties and bluff. Lying is not a sin that pirates worry about and it isn't difficult to make a few dozen pirates seem like a horde. The enemy can never be certain if those four dropships are filled with ace pilots and well-armed boarding crews, or if you're barely flying them with a skeleton crew. Fake radio traffic is also good to hide the size of your force. I once convinced a jumpship captain that the two hidden shuttles were actually my second and third jumpships. Maybe the most commonly used bluff is the practice of flying false colors a tactic as old as the Trojan horse. In the old days, a pirate could simply fly a false flag on his mast to lull a target as he approached. 
Now the same effect is produced with IFF transponders, stolen codes, inside information, and sometimes incredible acting. The trick is to make your prey think you are a friendly, or at least a neutral force. Passing your vessel as a supply ship or making garrison inspections are favorite ploys. Get yourself a couple of uniforms, convince the target that you arrived to inspect the units, let them line themselves up, and then fire away. Sometimes the oldest tricks are the most effective. For example, a Liao warrior house recently used the old Trojan horse ploy. They took a jump ship and scuffed it up a bit until it looked like it had been through the ringer. The guys at the local recharge station hold it into maintenance with no questions asked. After all, how could that be a threat? It contained no dropships, and the power reserves read as minimal. They were quite surprised when several crack infantry teams came out and quickly captured the station. Probably the most profitable activity for the modern-day pirate is interdicting jump ships. Typically, pirates will lay in wait at a known jump point, waiting for a potential target. I like this idea because it allows me to sit with a charged superconductor ring, ready to jump away if something untoward happens. Some pirates enjoy the surprise strike. They jump into the point after the target vessel and catch it with the sails unfurled. I've also blackmailed engineers into sabotaging the engines of a targeted ship, and compromised navigators so they would misjump their ship right into my hands. Whatever method they employ, pirates are always careful not to destroy a jump ship. Doing so borders on sacrilege. First of all, you lose the cargo if the target is destroyed. Secondly, destroying a jump ship means that there's one less vessel out there to transport potential booty. Finally, anyone who destroys a jump ship is sure to attract the attention of the great houses. Typically, pirates will disable jump ships by clipping the solar sails or coring the engine rooms and blowing their helium tanks. Both the tactics leave the vessel temporarily dead in space, but with no irreparable damage. Unfortunately, newer jump ships feature lithium fusion batteries, so a good pounding that cracks the superconductor ring is about the only way to stop it, before it jumps away out of the system. Eventually, you got to board the enemy. Many pirates use shuttles to send expendable boarding crews out to capture jump ships, before they dock, because docking with an unsecure vessel is an invitation to disaster. Derek Searchy, or Bloody Rick, for example, would hook his dropship to an innocent-looking jumpship, and then suddenly the vessel jumped 30 light-years away into a waiting armada of League military vessels. Then there's the Monopole incident. After capturing a Monopole Line's jumpship, Red Jack Ryan began to dock his dropship voracious with the vessel. Suddenly, the docking claw blew outward in a perfectly engineered blast doing little damage to the jump ship, but nearly gutting the voracious. Ryan was understandably angry, and after he destroyed three other Monopole jump ships in retaliation, Monopole scrapped its anti-piracy program entirely. However, the possibility that another line of jump ship captain may decide to take such a shot at pirates always remains viable. Raiding actual planetary targets is much riskier than interdicting a jump ship. Traveling in and out of a planetary system, dealing with the locals, dealing with the armed resistance, all of these increase the vulnerability of the pirate band. But the rewards can be far greater as well. Usually a planetary target yields a much greater selection of booty. Jump ships are like grab bags, you take what you get. On the other hand, a planetary raiding party can sit down and run through the shopping list. Munitions, fuel, foodstuffs, local gold reserves, prisoners, unexpected salvage, planetary targets always offer a smorgasbord of booty to choose from. How to handle a planetary raid, you may ask? I like to do them as quickly and violently as possible. Generally, you won't have to worry about damaging a precious jump ship or the like, so you're free to let loose the hounds. Bark at the defenders hard enough and they'll roll over. Then you can walk out with the governor family jewels in your hand. Coming in under stealth or false colors, and coming in at pirate points is almost mandatory, as you're gonna need the element of surprise. Once on the ground, or once your cover is blown, you want to neutralize any point of resistance. This might mean strafing the local spaceport and dropping a mech company to take out the local garrison, 
or simply landing a dropship on the local police headquarters. Keep your opponents off balance and afraid. Never let them see an argument between you and your men. Never show compassion. Defiance of any kind must be dealt with immediately and severely. Do not settle in and waste your time trying to get every last nickel hidden in someone's mattress. Get in, grab what you need, and get the hell out. Only the foolish, the desperate, or the suicidal wait around long enough for the opposition to get its act together. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the space pirates of the 31st century and beyond for today. Turns out there's a lot more to pirate lore than I either expected or imagined. Kudos to the great book that is the Battletech Field Manual Periphery Edition. Also some more good news for pirate fans out there. I will be making a second video on them, focusing on individual famous pirate bands. So do stay tuned for more. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts on the periphery pirates in the comments below. Did you ever play against them? What do you like or dislike most about them? If you found all this informative or entertaining, do consider leaving a like, share and subscribe for future content. Thanks a lot and have a healthy and awesome day.